Hello, welcome to the I'm Excited Podcast. I am your host, David Hicks. Whether you're watching or listening, thank you so much for doing so. May this be a blessing to you that you can take and not only use it to help yourself in your relationship with God, but use it to bless and help others around you. We have been talking about trying to do a deep dive into the subject of God and homosexuality, one of the most intense emotional subjects of our time. And one of the things that, that I've tried to start off with and I've tried to convey in the first two podcasts, the first two videos, is grief and sorrow. Because I know if you're, if you have gone down the road of homosexuality and you're watching this, you, you've probably been abused meant, uh, verbally, maybe physically. You've probably been persecuted and, and the thing that hurts the most is it's probably at times been by those who said they followed Jesus. And so one of the things where we who say we follow Jesus have been so wrong is in expressing meanness and cruelty toward anyone perceived to be homosexual. Didn't matter if you were engaging in it or not. We have been mean and we have been cruel. I have done this in the past in the form of making jokes or doing the voice and that kind of thing. And in that, for that, I, I apologize. It's just not the way of Jesus to mock other people. Um, the other thing for which in, in my last video I try to apologize for is silence when we see or hear those engaging in this cruelty. I point back to the story of a co-worker I had in, in, when the time I was doing some temp work who talked about how much you know, homosexuality angered him and if he saw somebody who he thought was gay, it just, it, just, it, it made him, he literally said it made him want to hit them. And instead of confronting this and, and saying this is not the way of Christ, this is not, this, that's radically different than what Jesus would want. I said nothing. I said nothing. And so when we have been silent, those of us who see this meanness or cruelty or the attitude therein and, and say nothing, we've we've done we've done you wrong. We've done Jesus wrong. And we've helped Satan by staying silent. So that is a huge, huge issue when it comes to this subject. We have helped Satan so much by either being mean or cruel or saying nothing when we see others being mean or cruel to those um, in the homosexuality or just perceived to be. And it goes beyond that uh, to other forms of sin as well. Now, what I've tried to emphasize is we talk about the subjects of homosexuality and, and being gay, being uh, having same-sex attraction, okay? Same-sex attraction, I haven't really used that expression much at all, if at all, but it's a, I, I define that in the same way I define gay, in that being gay, feeling physical attraction towards someone of the same gender. All that is is a description of something, a word used to this describe or define something that tempts you. Okay? I'm tempted at times by other people's spouses. I'm tempted at times at beautiful women, whether they're married or not. So, but that in and of itself is not sin. I feel an urge to go down that road a thought, a desire, but that in and of itself is not sin. What is sin would be me pursuing an outside of marriage uh, sexual relationship with that person who may not be married to anybody or an adulterous relationship, either A, because I'm married or I'm pursuing somebody that's married. So, Having the desire, though, in of itself is not 
wrong. So in that sense, it is not wrong to be gay. It's not. It's just a desire, a temptation, an attraction. Call it what you want. What is wrong, okay, is homosexuality, where we actually engage in sexual acts with people of the same gender, irregardless of whether we're attracted to them or not, or they're attracted to us. That is where we, I guess you might say, cross a line, if you will. But it's not just homosexuality that's wrong. We've seen God wants the sexual relationship in the environment of marriage, okay, um, between a man and a woman. So, the, it, in marriage, as created by God and affirmed by Jesus, it is between male and female, man and woman. And in that environment, yes, God ordains a sexual relationship. Read 1 Corinthians 7. It's encouraged. In fact, Paul tells husbands and wives, don't abstain from the sexual relationship. Don't neglect it. I mean, unless you're just going to give yourselves a prayer for, for a certain amount of time and then come back to it. Let Satan come along and tempt you to seek fulfillment of sexual desire elsewhere, outside of the marital bond that you have. So in marriage, it's wonderful. It's good. It's ordained. It's encouraged. Even commanded, if you will. But sexual acts outside of that environment, man and woman, not married to one another, or woman and woman, man and man, whatever. That is the environment where God does not want sexual relationships. And that is the environment in which they are wrong. So that's what we've tried to teach and, and read about and think about and process in our first couple of videos and podcasts. We'll pick up from there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Part of this will be a little bit of a review, um, but more of it will be new. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So Paul reminds him of all sorts of forms of wickedness that they used to do. Sexual immorality, just generically speaking, man, woman outside of marriage, like I mentioned before, for example, idolatry, adultery, um, now, it says here male prostitution nor homosexual offenders. What I've read is that there are two Greek words here related to homosexuality. One is the person doing the act on someone else. The other one who is passively letting the person commit that act of homosexuality on them. So two Greek words. One is the person actually doing the sexual act. The one is now, they're not being raped. They're willingly permitting that act to be done on them. So, in short, homosexuality. So, because we don't make that distinction. But it, that's not the only sin listed here. He talks about thieves and people who are greedy and people who are drunkards, people who are slanderers, people who are swindlers. If we continue in these ways and don't repent of them, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. We will not be citizens of the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom that God has designed and that is coming in its fullness. It's already here. You can already be a citizen of God's kingdom. You can sign up today by putting your faith in Jesus, deciding to follow him, being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. God washes your sins away, forgives you of your past, makes you clean. And he makes you a citizen of his kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. 
whose values, you know, different races, different cultures have different sets of values. Well, the values of the citizens of the kingdom of God, the culture of the kingdom of God is love, joy, mercy, peace, faith, kindness, goodness, perseverance, self-control, hope. You name the good thing, it is a value of the kingdom of God. That's our ways. That's our values. That's the the principles by which we try and live as God's citizens, as citizens of God's kingdom. So, but if we continue in these evil ways and don't repent of them, no, we cannot be a citizen of God's eternal kingdom. But he said, that's what you were. You were washed You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Think about that for a moment. Yes, you may have committed all sorts of homosexual acts, all sorts of sexual acts that weren't related to homosexuality. You can be washed, clean, forgiven, sanctified, justified by the Holy Spirit of God making you clean and forgiven. God's willing to do that if we repent and turn to him. You may have stolen all sorts of things. You may have lived your life in pure greed. You may have slandered and been mean and cruel to a whole bunch of people in a whole bunch of ways. You can turn from this and be forgiven. That's what a lot of those first that Corinthians had done. I'll quickly read the rest of this. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Um, That is like a deep verse with deep discussion. Basically, hold on to that. I will not be mastered by anything. We cannot let our evil desires master us. We must master them. Food for the stomach and stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Your body, your life isn't meant to live pursuing sexual immorality. Your life is meant to pursue God. God is pursuing you. Pursue him in return. He didn't make our bodies to where we'd be enslaved to its lust and pursue sexual immorality left and right. No, we pursue the Lord and we pursue what is right and what is good. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us all, all, us also. I talked about God's kingdom being eternal. How is it going to be eternal for us? Because God is going to raise us from the dead like he raised Jesus from the dead. Verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? He's talking to those who've already given their life to Jesus. Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. When two people engage in sexual acts with one another, they become one body. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All their sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? In other words, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Who is in you? Whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. We belong to God now. So through our bodies, we should honor God. He is our master. We are his servant. So instead of pursuing lust, greedful, harmful lust, we should pursue holiness and righteousness and what is right in the eyes of our master. All right, so let's keep going. We're talking about is homosexuality wrong? Uh, In Romans chapter one, one of the more famous passages we are going to read how God describes it, uh, depending on the translation you're looking at, as a perversion. And it's going to be, again, grouped with all sorts of other things in which God does not want us to engage. 
So here we go, Romans 1, 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. When we do things evil in God's sight, we suppress in our minds the truth. We don't want to know the truth because if we knew the truth, then we'd feel guilty and, 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 turn from, and know that we should turn from the things that we really truly want to do. We don't want someone stopping us from doing the evil that's in our hearts, so we suppress that truth. Verse 19, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse if we were to be intellectually honest with ourselves. And look at creation. It screams that there is a creator, that there is a designer, that this, there is as many wonderful theories, I use wonderful sarcastically, that are out there about how things could have possibly come together without a creator. If we're really truly to be intellectually honest, there's no way. There's just no way. I mean, just look at the inner workings of one cell and DNA and RNA and the things, all the things that come together to make a cell fully, uh, to replicate itself. Just that one act. So complicated, so amazing. There's no way for it to just happen by accident. Um, so God's invisible qualities, the eternal power and divine nature, you can see it all over nature, all over creation. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. The first, the major steps that mankind took away from God. Man knew God was real. If you've gone back to Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, they all talked to God himself. And their children Afterwards, how long did they, did anyone get the opportunity to see God himself before, you know, God no longer walked on the earth among mankind? Don't know. But you see Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel themselves talking to God, fossy foss. Mankind in the beginning knew they were created by God. But how did they get away from him? How did they go far from him? Um... They didn't glorify him as God, nor gave thanks to him. Two things happened. They didn't give God the glory and honor. They didn't give God his due as being their creator, and they stopped giving thanks to him. And for it went all downhill from there. Verse 22, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Mankind started worshiping the things that God created as opposed to the one who created them. Very foolish. Verse 20 of us to do so. Verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. What did that just say? God gave them over to shameful lust, lust that we should not pursue lust that we should not feed within ourselves. And so women exchange the natural relations for unnatural ones. They exchange men for women, having sexual relations with women. Men did the same thing. They burned in their lust, and instead of going to women, they went to men. 
And, God, and it says, and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Don't exactly know what that means. Some have insinuated that a lot of the disease you see, is this is a reference to a lot of disease that comes from homosexuality. That that was part of the penalty of this perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. Apply that to our technological advances today. How we use, we invent things and do evil with them. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Approve of, not only do they do the evil, they approve of others who do the, these same evils. See, it's not just homosexuality that is part of a cor corrupt, depraved mind. And again, I'm talking about the not the desire, not the temptation. Okay, I'm talking about the action. The action. Whether it's actions of greed, actions of deceit, actions of malice, actions of gossip, actions of hate, or and yes, actions of homosexuality and other adultery and other forms of sexual immorality. There, Satan will drag us as deep into darkness as he possibly can. God's enemy, Satan. The evil forces, the evil spiritual forces that work in this world, they will drag us as far away from God as they possibly can, as deep into evil as they possibly can. And that's what happened to mankind. They, did, they no longer gave God his place as God in their lives, and they stopped thanking him for his blessings. And it led to all sorts of things. And yes, homosexuality was one of them. So yes, is homosexuality wrong? Uh, so yes, homosexuality is wrong in God's sight, among many other things. But should that stop us from coming to Jesus? And the answer is unequivocally no. No matter how much homosexuality or adultery or man and woman, neither one of you married sexual morality you've committed in the past, it should not stop you from coming to Jesus. Luke chapter 7. Okay, Luke chapter 7. One of the most beautiful stories of the life of Jesus in all of Scripture. All right, Luke 7, and we'll read uh, verse 36 through 50. And heads up, I am not going to get through this, this whole thing. We'll have to address the part of why did God make me gay in the next video. My apologies. But Luke 7, verse 36 through 50. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, she's described as a sinful woman, probably a prostitute, probably a euphemism for a prostitute. No matter, but doesn't really, the specifics don't really matter. Verse 38, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Remember, this is the days of sandals, walking on dirt roads. People's feet got very dirty. They weren't, you know, this isn't the days of socks. Okay, so now she's, she's washing Jesus' feet with her own tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. That's what she did for Jesus' feet. And notice, Simon the Pharisee, oh, we haven't gotten that point, the guy, the Pharisee's house. Okay, let me back up just for a moment here. I'm jumping the gun a little bit and not explaining things as I should. 
Pharisees were a very strict religious group, the strictest religious group of the Jews in Jesus' day. Just like pretty much every religion has ever been invented, mankind has a way of taking it and dividing it into different camps instead of saying unified. And that was no different with the, in Jesus' day amongst the Jews. There were different religious uh, groups. The Sadducees, for example, who didn't believe in angels or spirits. The Pharisees, extremely strict, had all sorts of rules, laws, and regulations. But in the midst of creating all these rules, laws, and regulations and that were in addition to the law of Moses and trying to keep them, they forgot the big picture of the laws of Moses. And they neglected things like love, justice, mercy, and faith in exchange for things like making sure you wash your hands before you eat. Um, so Jesus was basically eating in enemy territory. A Pharisee had invited him into Jesus' house, uh, invited him into his house, and so Jesus did go and eat with him. And now here's this woman who comes in. Let's read what happens. Verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. So the Pharisee looked and thought Jesus should think himself too important, too great to be touched by this sinful woman. Probably if you struggle with homosexuality, you know it's like to get the evil eye from religious people even those who say they follow Jesus. And that's one of the things I've tried to decry and condemn in this series. She was getting the look. She was getting the sneers. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. That's how we know his name was Simon, Simon the Pharisee. Tell me, teacher, he said, two men owed money to a certain money list. One owed him 500 denarii, uh, days, 500 days wages, that's what it means, and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay them back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to, among them, began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is why I'm telling you, whatever you've done in the past, do not let it stop you from coming to Jesus. He stands eager to receive you, but come to him in humility. Come to him in sorrow and, and expressing regret for the things that you've done that you know are not pleasing to him. He stands ready and eager to forgive. Now, in this day and age, after his resurrection, after he sent out his apostles, the message of salvation through Jesus that they preached was put your faith in him, repent and be baptized. He will wash away your sins. And then we just grow from there. This is before that time. And here Jesus just straight up forgives her of her sins because she showed great love. And Jesus loved her in return. He did not deny the fact that she was a sinful woman. He knew she had committed many sins. He received her, forgave her, let her touch him anyway because Jesus had deep love for this woman deeper than even the love she showed him. It is the same for you. It is the same for us all. You don't have to be afraid to come to Jesus, whatever you have done. We will pick up from there in our next podcast and video. Thank you for listening.